This is the Federal Mobility Policy Update with Ian Duncan from the Washington Post, Alyssa Walker from Curbed in New York Magazine, Beth Osborne from Transportation for America, Martha Rosowski from the Mobility and Access Collaborative, and Daryl Young from the Merck Family Fund. This week, we'll cover the top stories of 2022 with transportation experts and transportation journalists. We'll look at the Inflation Reduction Act and other federal funding. What does it mean for safety, for more roads, for lower GHG, and what will be the top stories of the new year? All that and more on this week's edition of the Federal Mobility Policy Update. Welcome to a year in edition of the Federal Mobility Policy Update. With us, we're going to be covering the top stories of the year and try to forecast where we're we going in 2023. With us on our panel today, we have Ian Duncan from the Washington Post. Hi, Ian. Hello. Thanks for having me. We have Alyssa Walker with Curbed and New York Magazine. Hi, Alyssa. Hello. And we've got Beth Osborne from the Transportation for America group. Hi, Beth. Thank you. And we have Martha Rosowski from the Mobility and Access Collaborative. Hi, Martha. Hello, all. Nice to be well, here today. Nice to have you. Let's start out with uh, one of the biggest stories of the year. Uh, and let's ask each of you, our reporter friends, what do you see as the top stories of the year? We'll start with you, Ian. So I think I see a couple of buckets, maybe. I definitely think that gas prices obviously colored everyone's experience of getting around. Um, seems like they've started to come down. Uh, but it was really consuming a, a lot of attention at the White House and just for basically anyone who had to go and fill up their their pump. I'm not really sure that it's going to have ended up having much of a kind of a long tail if, if they do kind of come down and stay at a more reasonable level. But I think in terms of people's day-to-day -day experience, that has got to be number one. Uh, and then I think, you know, on the sort of the policy side, we had the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act um, huge subsidies in there for uh, trying to get people into electric vehicles kind of remains to be seen how, how much of an accelerant that's going to be, I think. Um, and then we sort of were really starting to get into the thick of implementing the infrastructure law. Uh, and we saw USDOT kind of grappling with um, how to roll out some of these big grant programs. You know, they've got all this money and now they have to spend it basically. Um, so I think I'd sort of, yeah, like those as, as top ones for me. Great. And Alyssa, you cover the areas outside the Beltway. What are you seeing across the United States? Yeah, I mean, how how interesting that we had uh, like high gas prices really did dominate the entire kind of agenda, transportation agenda. And as we were talking before the show began, we really thought that this would translate into some type of behavior change when it came to people choosing to get around a different way. And likely probably many people did out of necessity just because it was very expensive to fill up your car. But I think what we were also hoping was to see this uh, translate into a, a mode shift in a way or, or uh, this, this kind of uh, balancing of the equilibrium on streets, especially when it came to things like pedestrian safety. And again, the numbers got even higher than they did last year. So we're at this real inflection point, I think, as a country um, where you have the top people yeah, all the way at USDOT to very small cities that are actually saying now they want to do something about this. I think the the it's, there's no longer a debate about um, how important it is to, to start to implement these things, but then then where where to start. And I would like to say there has been at least a little bit of uh, light in the, in the at the end of the tunnel. Um, there were some uh, slow streets efforts uh, to at least keep cars either moving slowly or off of certain streets in a lot of large cities left over for the pandemic that did stay that even got like huge uh, mandates. When you look at something like San Francisco, they've done such a great job actually building them into corridors where you can get across the city. And then they have this ballot measure where they could keep uh, the Great Highway open uh, part of the time. And actually, you know, you saw people voting in huge numbers to make that happen. And then I will say at the same time, too, just some incredible reporting. I just saw this year just these great stories in The New Yorker, outside, in Vox, uh, at my own outlet curbed, about what works and about centering the families that are losing people um, to traffic violence and and how the, the city officials can't really look away anymore and and really that getting through to people who are making the decisions. 
Beth, do you think the political courage is starting to emerge within elected officials who have made, I wouldn't say they've been performative, but they've certainly made commitments to Vision Zero. And so far, they've got not a lot to show for those Vision Zero commitments. Um, do you think there's a, as Alyssa said, there's a sea change that's coming about? I think there's growing effort at the local level. Now, keep in mind, there are over 80,000 local jurisdictions, and we tend to focus on maybe the top uh, 100 in terms of population size. Um, so uh, that that will have a big impact on, on a portion of the population. But asking each one of 80,000 jurisdictions to figure this out on their own is going to be a real struggle, especially considering the fact that their most dangerous roads are owned by the states. Um, when we released Dangerous by Design last year, we found that 60% of uh, pedestrian fatalities in 2020 occurred on arterial roadways, which only make up 15% of the roadways. And they're all, they're overwhelmingly owned by the states. So these local commitments, and even with the greatest courage at the local level, doesn't overcome that problem because that's the concentration of the problem. And I don't see the same level of courage there. However, more and more locals who are armed to go toe to toe with their state and push their states to try new things in new contexts can only help. Um, and I do think there are certain states that are more open to it than others. At the federal level, I think there's good intention at USDOT, not uh, a, a lot of really bold uh, permanent action like changing of regulations and rules. Um, and I think that there is zero interest and or courage at the congressional level. Let's talk a little bit about the state federal interface as it relates to the IRA and the IIJA, which is funding for transit and for reconnecting communities. Uh, I'd like your collective impressions on early days in the rollout. Um, what should we be looking for? What did we see this year since the IIJA money was out early? And with this massive influx of EV charging infrastructure money, what should we be looking for? What have we seen so far to date? Martha, did you want to comment on that? I've been looking at the question of whether this federal money, both increased formula funds, some new discretionary programs, are they actually headed toward different outcomes on the ground? Like you say, it's still early. Um, the discretionary programs are exciting. The language in thriving communities, the language in reconnecting communities is really great. And I applaud USDOT for being visionary. Um, as Beth will point out, it's a small chunk of the money, as usual, where most of the money is still in formula funds, just, you know, chugging through the state DOTs and, you know, which highway widening's next on the list. Um, I do worry, even for the discretionary programs, it's great language, but we don't have the, uh, the infrastructure maybe not the right word, we don't have the uh, framework on the ground to really use that money well yet. Um, in Colorado, I heard some good ideas for the money starting to float up, but they couldn't get it together in time for this cycle of grant requests. I think in the next couple of years, we will see better projects moving forward. But what these state and even localities have on the shelf are often just you know more roadway widening projects, more resurfacing projects. And I think they're looking, some of them are looking at those projects of can we just like put lipstick on the pig, you know, widen our highway, but build a freeway cap across it to connect communities. And won't that be lovely? Um, we also have not done the planning that we need, and we don't yet have the networks between community groups, various community interests and the agencies to really think differently about projects. I see some of that starting to bubble up. Um, I will say that philanthropy has not yet stepped into that space in any meaningful way where some investment in that space could be really, really, really helpful so that we're not just relying on planning grants, you know, federal bureaucracy to come up with new projects. Whew, okay, that was a lot. Can, can I ask a question jumping off of what you all just said? Um, sure. And this is for Ian and Alyssa. Um, it, there's my light. I haven't moved. Um, so uh, a lot of what we need to figure out what the big story of next year is, is tracking the way all this money is spent. 
And we rely, I mean, sometimes groups like mine can track it. Uh, we've done reports like repair priorities and um, dangerous by design, but a lot of it relies on you all to track. And I'm curious, um, you know, what, how easy or hard is that to do? Um, are you seeing any change in the availability of data from either the federal government or state governments in order to, to do these analyses? And also, you know, what do you have your eye on uh, watching over the next year? So I guess that wasn't one question that might've been three or four. I think, I mean, it's definitely still a challenge and I don't think that we've seen uh, really much new from the federal government. I, I asked actually Buttigieg about this uh, in the summer and, and he was like, yeah, we're really grappling with like, how do we track the formula money and, and kind of show the results? And it, I mean, it's uh, like with so many things like they should be at the end of their first four year cycle um, for the performance measures. And we haven't seen that data and that would sort of give us a baseline, I guess, or at least and a yardstick. Um, and so you kind of, I mean, the um, American Road Builders, Road and Transportation Building Association, um, th fun. their economist is pretty good at kind of passing some of these incredibly arcane highway administration databases. And she has uh, put some stuff up suggesting that states have started 29,000 projects um, this year and about 40% are kind of maintenance. I think a fifth are widenings and then maybe like seven or eight percent is new construction and then that leaves the rest of the money for other things. Um, but that's kind of a mind boggling number and some of those projects will be tiny and some of the projects that are huge and might command attention might not be representative and so it's sort of very hard to get your your hands around um and and hard to kind of tell stories that matter for people i think you know who don't happen to live near the particular project that's being built. yeah what it i'd is... like to see oh sorry no no go ahead go ahead go ahead what i'd like to see mm -hmm. is not just at this amazing dashboard like you're talking about like how many yeah how many miles of you know bike lanes have gone in but also um, these trackers for like the number of electric vehicles or electric bikes or you know how, how many people are using these tools uh, and these subsidies and these tax credits and all these things and then like an informational portal where you could actually find out what you are able to do as a resident of this country. I mean, the, the greatest thing about some of these local initiatives that I'm thinking of, like Denver's e-bike credit, for example, is they made it so easy. Like it was just like the easy, well, except for the part where it was the demand was so high that everybody, you know, couldn't actually get it. But like they were so transparent about the data, they adjusted the program and added more, you know, so more people could take advantage of it. The income levels were very clear. And we need to see that from the federal government as well, like from everything from, you know, getting an electric car to like getting a heat pump. It's very, very, very uh, not transparent at this point. I was impressed that a number of local governments and states stepped up when the federal money was silent on e-bikes, that a number of, uh, of communities have stepped up to offer rebates, but that they've need tested the rebates. So you don't have the same people who can afford a bike just getting a discount, but people who really can can need them and use them. I think that's that's an interesting step up at a time when cities are and counties and states are trying to wrangle with their fiscal implications. Let me ask a little bit can about... I, Eric, yeah, can I jump in just on e-bikes? Yeah. I, I think there's a revolution going on with e-bikes, but the climate funders are not, you know, the EV funders are not paying attention to e-bikes because they're too small. They don't, you know, they're not going to catch enough um, GH. They're not going to convert enough GHG. The federal stuff was silent on e-bikes, no love there. And yet this thing is happening. Uh, you know, I bought an e-bike this year. I love it. I'm like zipping all over town and just the potential to deploy those quickly in mass is so big. And it builds that constituency for better infrastructure. It just, it like, you know, like Alyssa says in Denver, those e-bike credits went so fast. People just snapped them up. And yet they live in this, this sort of weird world where they're not quite, you know, embraced by, by anyone and yet they're happening. I will say, I think that the feds 
um, the joint office between the Department of Energy and Transportation that is in charge of deploying the uh, discretionary funds for um, uh, EV uh, recharging stations is entirely focused on making sure that those stations are available for all kinds of vehicles, including bikes and scooters. And even I've heard talk about general charging. For the public. So if you have to charge a phone while you're waiting for your car to charge or something like that. So at least with that portion, I really think there's some huge creativity coming out of that joint office. And it'll be interesting to see um, if they can parlay that into some greater creativity and how the formula dollars for charging is used. Let's talk a little bit about the EVs, not a little bit. Let's talk a lot about EVs because so much money in the IRA went to EV, not only charging infrastructure, but EV discounts. What is that going to do to the marketplace, one? Because the vehicles that are eligible, as far as I understand, are not going to be the Teslas. They've already filled out that there's a whole other segment of the market that's going to be plussed out. And then I also want to hear from you, Beth, about charging infrastructure in places that don't normally get that, rural communities. Do we go beyond the highway off-ramps and go into communities themselves? Talk a little bit about that. Oh, you want me to start? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we get to rural communities, I think we just need to talk about how people move. Um, you know, the way uh, infrastructure bills and, and DOTs talk about people moving versus the way, you know, those who who work or, or try to deploy technology is striking to me. You know, if you were Apple, and you were trying to serve people as they move, you'd start by looking at where they are and where they're going, which is all very local. Majority of trips are, you know, three miles or under, relatively close to home, more so post-COVID. Um, the If people are traveling along interstates, uh, it's typically for a work trip, not always, but often for a work trip. People aren't generally pulling over to charge their vehicle for 30 minutes on their work trip. Um, they're looking for that to be at home or close to home or where they're going on their errands. Like maybe you can plug in while you're at the grocery and everything about the federal approach is focused on these long distance holes along interstates, which is not, that's because that's where the engineers focus. That's because that's where the federal program comes from and deploying interstates, but it's completely disconnected from their customer. And that is going to be problematic. That's going to be problematic in rural areas, too, where people want to charge where they are and where they're going, and that may or may not be right off the interstate again. They might travel along the interstate, but maybe if they travel from their community to the hospital, you know, that's a couple of towns down, they still want to charge at the hospital, not along the interstate. They're not going to drop off their vehicle and then go to the hospital. So um, I think we need a significantly more consumer focused approach to, to EV charging, including the experience. Um, we need more charger oriented development, frankly, um, you know, where, especially while it might take longer to charge, you, you're just, people aren't going to sit out in their car at night along the interstate. I'm not going to. I guarantee women and people of color are not going to be excited about being in a, a lone charger at, you know, midnight waiting for their car to charge. And that doesn't matter if there's lighting and it doesn't matter if there's an attendant. You want to go someplace where there's a coffee shop or a bookstore or a grocery or something. Um, and I think we're going to have to consider those sorts of issues. And the last thing I'll say is we're good at constructing. We're terrible at operating. You know, that everything about the federal program is we'll build something and then cross our fingers that you make it work. And that's really not going to work here. This is much more like transit than highways. It needs constant love and attention. There are a million questions about how to manage these things. At the end of four years, we could have as many broken chargers as built chargers. So who's in charge of not just maintaining the charger, but like plowing around the charger or, you know, clearing debris around the charger? Who's in charge of making sure it is built high enough in areas that might flood? Who's in charge of, I mean, it's just, there's so many issues that we really need to dig into. And the DOTs are not designed, nor are they super excited about being operators. So we need to get to the bottom of that and at least give them a lot of help so long as we're trying to create a new market ministry. 
Should that be outsourced to a vendor that would provide that service to the DOT so that they don't have to get in that business? Only if the DOT is incredibly talented at managing a contract for a vendor. I mean, that is the plan, though. I mean, I think it's pretty clear looking at the, the plans that the state submitted is they don't think they're going to do this themselves by any stretch of the imagination. Like, they're going to outsource this. Um, I, but they're going to find out that no one cares that they had a contractor when something fails, they will be blamed. Um, I, I I think a lot of what you're saying makes sense. I think I, I do think that there's possibly an insight that that federal team had about the interstate charging which is that people have an expectation that their car will go a thousand miles even though they maybe never do that or they might do it once or twice a year that you're when you buy a car what you're buying is this ability to do something and if you feel like an electric vehicle just can't do one of the things that you think a car is supposed to be able to do that that's a mental block for people and you know you see smart people saying that, uh, you know, we have to start thinking differently about how we drive if everyone's going to have electric vehicles. But I think that what the Biden team have kind of figured out is that, or decided, is that they want to not have to make people jump through mental hoops to make this transition. Like, they want to make this experience as similar to gasoline as, as possible. But uh, gasoline has stations all through their neighborhoods, too. Uh, and what I see, yes. they're so afraid of range that they've forgotten to do step one. And so I very much, if, I, if I'm putting on my prediction hat, it is that we will have great chargers for long distance trips and people will then realize they're not comfortable buying it because they don't know that they can charge locally. That wish that I could see that too. So yeah. <laughs> I feel like this whole discussion is so encapsulated by the USPS truck <laughs> dilemma, which is still ongoing, right? So we had this big um, proposal that we were going to redesign these trucks to be like this glorious pedestrian safety um, design uh, that that looks really good. But then they kept saying there were a lot of them were going to be gas powered. Now we're we keep pushing that. I don't know what we're number we're at yet, but they they keep going more and more to saying they're going to make them EVs. And there's always other lawsuits and being threatened, and it's just ongoing. But I think that's really to Beth's point. Like. This is the like easiest thing, the most low hanging fruit to do this. This like weird reticence that's coming from the top is like very evocative of this. But then at the same time, you've had over the same year, you know, a lot of delivery vehicles have gotten both smaller and gone to electric. We have this adorable little electric uh, fire truck in LA now. So we really do have, you know, there there really are some some wins being seen um, when it comes to especially the the vehicles that were really too big in the first place to be moving around our cities and are just going on these loops. Uh, I got to go see the amazing BYD factory north of LA and seeing the, all the different types of buses and vehicles that they're making. Um, the good stuff is happening and let's get people onto the shared vehicles first and then maybe we won't have to worry so much about this other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I do think the there's a such a focus on personal EVs and making it work for everybody. And yet the fleet pieces, the freight pieces are so powerful. When you look at impacts in communities, near warehouses, near ports, um, I'm, I'm excited to see more attention and love being given to freight. And I think that's a place where the interstate system makes sense. Um, I wanna pivot just a little bit and talk about transit. Y'all didn't put that as your top story, but it's sort of this ever looming story um, you know, we're facing a transit funding cliff. Transit ridership has not recovered from COVID the way we wish it would, or I wish it would have. Um, there's a severe operator shortage. Let's pivot a little bit to looking forward. What do you, what do you think our story around transit is going to be in the next year or so? So I think in DC, there's definitely these challenges for metro um there's this kind of weird dynamic where the trains are actually quite crowded because they're still without most of their newest trains because of this safety problem from 2021 and so you, when you're on the system it kind of feels like 
I was quite busy and there's lots of people on here, especially, you know, at those commuter times. But then there's signs like I, I possibly said this, you know, last this time last year that like when I go into the garage where I leave my car to get onto the train, it's still really empty. Um, and that's just the sign that, you know, more suburban ridership, I think, has not probably come back anything like to where it was. Um, and then buses are in this odd position of the ridership never dropped off um quite as much but that the driver shortage is very acute i think riders feel as though the service quality has really got worse and they maybe don't have as many other options and so like they're stuck with just the worst product basically um and you know so one of the answers that we've seen or a way to kind of throw people a bone is the interest in free bus travel and uh, dc looks like it's going to be launching that come july uh which you know people are excited about that i think we kind of forget sometimes how low income a lot of bus riders are and that that 50 dollars a month in bus fares is is real money back to people um but it, it doesn't do anything to address the problems about reliability frequency um and you know there, there's compelling reasons I think to think that diverting money to covering the cost of fares is money that you might better spend on tackling some of those problems. So it, it, it is, it's not a particularly bright picture in some ways. Yeah. There was an interesting article in The Atlantic which compared the legitimate reasons for free fares or low fares and compared it against the amount of money that would be spent by the District of Columbia for these reduced fares or free fares and said for that amount of money, you could increase service after hours for hospital workers, people have to work late at night. And so where is the equity in that? These people not having bus service that's free is not better than having bus service that's free. And so and I think that's a challenge. DC is trying to do both. So there, there yeah. is money in their package for for some 24 yeah. hours service. So that's a potential reason to think that it doesn't have to be an either or you know, because the way that it gets filtered through politics, you do both. But, um, but yeah, it is, but I think it is an important point to think about service. I, I think one of the other things, if you look at riders' surveys and, mm -hmm. and their complaints and their reasons for not taking transit, the cost is rarely mentioned. This is not what's keeping people off. It's frequency uh, or lack of dependability. Sometimes riders will complain about how difficult it is to get the discounted fares uh, for lower income people. It is too hard. Um, so I, look, I, I'm totally fine with uh, with free transit I, as long as it in no way reduces the quality of it. Um, and I think one of the challenges right now of doing both, as Ian said, the the driver shortage is it's overwhelming. There's so many areas that are talking about increasing frequencies, but not having the drivers to actually supply it. And that's not just a funding issue. It's really thinking about the way we uh, we we schedule drivers, the breaks we give them. And the other big thing is dealing with riders who are treating those bus drivers like garbage. Yeah, I mean, here in LA, we, that's our transit ambassador program, the, the other Metro. Um, we have, have seen so much positive feedback from people just saying, we love having these ambassadors and they're just, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're, I call them like, they just kind of like are there, <laughs> you know, they're just like, they're bystanders and they, they help you decide, like, you know, give you directions or clean up this spilled uh, milk that is on the train seat or something. Or, or like you said, like can act as like a, an interventionist when something like that is happening, which is, has been deafening a lot. I interviewed a, an MTA bus driver um, the week after some of those really horrible attacks that were in New York City and, and talking about, you know, they don't even want to enforce fares because it leads to conflicts that could in, in turn put them in danger. So that actually is one 
could be one argument. It's not the best one, but just for them saying like, I don't want enforcement to be part of my job at all as, as a bus driver. Um, and what I think to the other point of like, you know, this, this big trade-off LA ended our big unofficial experiment with free buses. Um, the data was pretty amazing. Just hearing from people uh, who actually said they did take it because it was free or it was easier for them to take it because it was free. But then we restored our service and we, it was always looking you know, like we were never going to get to this date that we've supposedly restored it, but there are a lot of canceled runs still happening. It doesn't mean that our system is performing the same way. So you know, our fare recovery is very, very small compared to our overall budget. It's, it wouldn't be a big deal for us to get rid of it. We're spending a lot of money to like do these types of programs. It should probably just be free. But I think the joke here is like, you should just keep it free until you make it better because we we shouldn't have to pay for it. <laughs> Let's pivot to something that I saw spring up that I did not predict would happen was that the number of municipalities that have reduced park or eliminated parking minimums say that if you develop a building or you develop a residential development, you do not have to have parking, which developers love because that's wasted space. Um, how, would you have predicted that the number of cities are, that are taking that on is it's pretty amazing, right? Am I am I wrong? What What's the cause of that? Do you think the reduction of parking minimums? We had that here, our statewide, which was really exciting now. Yeah. So we actually have been, you've seen it kind of been incrementally carved out um, uh, city to city, but we now finally have it happening. Um, and there is a lot of questions about, um, you know, how how easily I guess it will be to actually start to see <laughs> this happen because we have buildings being built down the street for me that still have like a thousand parking spaces like right next to our metro stations, which is just mind blowing. Um, but I think there's just a real, I think what, what helped here with the argument is how much it is eating into the cost of building housing to provide 2.3 parking spaces for some of these new housing units. I mean, that is absolutely, it's, it's unsustainable for many for you know, many different perspectives, um, but I think we have to get serious about building housing. And the connection was just climate connection is good, but the the cost of housing connection was was too good not to ignore. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Yeah, Daryl, I think I agree with Alyssa. The housing affordability crisis, the housing supply crisis, is I think pushing things in a way that we haven't seen before. You know, causing people once they dive into, okay, how do we deal with the, the need of housing across the spectrum? You know, affordable housing, the unhoused, um, it is putting parking on the radar screen of people who had not thought about it or who thought it was sacred and you could never touch it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the new tech or, 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 or the new business. It's not that new anymore. Let's talk a little bit about Uber and what's going on with rideshare services and Uber. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts as to what is the state of that? I know that in California, they are randomly in San Francisco testing AVs or, or automated vehicles um, to uh, driverless cars. Um, anyone want to comment on, on how you see that moving the, the rideshare as well as the, Autonomous vehicles. Well, I rode in one. Have you been in them? Have you have you have anyone been in one yet? Is there... I've not. Oh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> so I just was going to say I mean, the post was part of this Uber Files project this this summer, which we had a bunch of leaked internal Uber documents, and it, it went back a few years, but it was really a kind of incredible level of insight into some of the kind of the fastest years of growth for this company and how it relied on some pretty questionable tactics to get there, like strong arming foreign companies and, and cozying up to foreign politicians in ways that maybe to us here in the States would not be that unusual, but I think really raised some eyebrows in, in Europe where the kind of rules and, and standards around that stuff are, are different. Um, I did a piece about them working with some oligarchs to try and break into to Russia. Uh, and, and from a sort of transportation perspective, it was just a reminder that this company came in with just absolutely gobs of investor money to kind of burn through um, with not always the, the best consideration of what that meant for drivers and what they're asking them to do. One of the stories in our package was about drivers in San Francisco, uh, in South Africa. Um, who really took some kind of awful 
risks on behalf of Uber and, and didn't have the backing of the company. Um, and, it, and it's sort of easy to forget now, but we just sort of take Uber a bit for granted as being part of the landscape. I mean, I do think my personal experience with it has been that it's more expensive and it's less, it's, it's not as quick as it was a few years yeah. ago. It's maybe not surprising. Um, but but it, it's still just a part of the infrastructure that kind of goes unremarked on, I think, now. Yeah, and we had that during the same time those Uber files stories were coming out. We had a show, Super Pumped, based on the book, you know, really the, like this inner look at how, um, you know, not not just the toxic culture within the company, but the, the way that they were going to cities like San Francisco was the first one and, and really like tricking them <laughs> into thinking that this was going to relieve their traffic problems, um, that they needed to jump on board to show that they were innovative. And it was just so funny to see those things playing out at the same time, um, you know, both the dramatized version and also kind of the real reporting coming out at the same time. Good, good show. Um, very hard to watch if you're a transportation <laughs> advocate. <laughs> good holiday viewing. Um, <laughs> pivoting to the holidays, many of us are going to be getting on planes. Um, let we, we could not talk about transportation without talking a little bit about airlines and where we are with those. And how has the airline industry fared I heard an interesting story that United Airlines is looking for a future where there's less gates, less landing strips, and so that's going to change the way that they offer their services. Um, what do you? What's your? What's your? The, let's talk to the reporters. What's your take on where we are with aviation right now? So, my 2022 started with me being trapped at my in-laws' house in Seattle for just interminable. Repeated. I don't know that you want to say that on on, on our show. That, <laughs> Be I'm sure his in-laws watched. I didn't say anything about that. The in-laws were highly pleasant. It was the big okay, guy. very good. good. Good, nice recovery. Nice recovery. Um, and uh, but um, and that was Omicron, you know, and it was it was, but it was weather, and it was just like I mean, it was really really deep. So I was stuck, and I was also writing about people being stuck, uh, and um, you know, and then, then they really struggled to kind of bounce back from that. Like you saw some airlines that got absolutely walloped, did kind of pull back their ambitions. Alaska kind of um, actually had a pretty good recovery after that. But like all through the summer, it became a big political dispute. You know, Boots Judge was really trying to kind of hold the airlines accountable. The airlines were blaming the FAA for mismanaging the airspace. I mean, it all got quite, quite nasty. Um, and then Thanksgiving came and went and was really smooth i mean really really low rates of cancellations even compared to what you might have seen before the pandemic um so i mean hard to know because thanksgiving of 2021 was pretty smooth too so you you you've got to be careful about making predictions but i think they will be going into christmas and the new year feeling pretty good and if they can have a pretty smooth christmas they might be able to sort of put a lot of the sort of the, the really bad um the PR around this behind them. Um, but again, you got to be careful about making predictions, I think. Yes, with the airlines, you do. One good blizzard will throw it all out of whack. Right. Um, as we tr transition to the predictions of 2021, we cannot cover the year without talking about the railroad strike or the p potential for railroad strike and labor issues. Anyone would like to comment on, on the way that was arrived at or not arrived at if depending on your viewpoint on that i think here in la just being uh so close to the port um we've really seen a shift in um focusing on the workers that are moving the freight through um through through our city to get to everywhere else basically um over the last year there's been um you know, we we started the year with or actually last holiday season we had this um just smog that just kind of sat over the city for a few months as they started to do that 24-hour operations again and you had all these um container ships idling and then you had you know just the, it just it just you know snowballs all the way through the city all the way out to the inland empire where we have these distribution centers so finally people started to see like this is not a situation that anyone wants to keep you know happening in our city and we had a lot of focus towards um zero emission vehicles to try to you know move goods in a, a different way through the city and and electrified rail all these other things that we're trying to do 
but it comes down to the workers. It comes down to paying the workers. It comes down to giving the workers leave. You know, they are the people who are doing all these things. And um, just, just, you know, I, th I would say if, if anything, there has been a heightened awareness here. And if we can start to fix the problem locally, because it is coming down to a lot of our um, air resources uh, mandates and, uh, and as far as like how we uh, move our goods, um, I, I do see some some good changes happening um, where hopefully we'll be able to be you know part of this solution. Good. It feels like there's certainly a residue of regret that has emerged from it. I think the labor unions have um, felt a little railroaded, pardon the pun. Uh -huh. uh, that that the term doesn't come from nowhere. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but then that speaks to the larger issue list that you were talking about, about supply chain and the disruptive nature of it. I was I was surprised when people were saying well, it was going to affect the holidays. Most holiday goods are already have been arrived. It's not like this railroad crisis, this labor crisis is going to end anything. Um, unfortunately, we have to end the show. So we're going to turn to our final issue, which is, and last year, we predicted a number of things, many of which came about. Certainly safety was one we did not expect to turn worse. I'd love to hear from all of you what you think the predictions for the stories for 2023 will be, and then we'll come back a year from now and look at how good our predictions were. Who wants to start? I, I will take on a couple of things. I mean, I think um, some of these we've already touched on, but I do think we're going to see these battles over the highway expansions and, and the federal government intervening there, um, really kind of heating up. Um, I think from some reporting I've been doing, like it's just going to be very messy. You know, it was quite easy for the Biden administration to come in and say, like, we want to make a break with the past. And you can't really do that so easily. The past is there encased in concrete in the middle of all these cities. And so figuring out what to do with that is going to be this huge and, and really contentious um, uh, storyline, I think, that plays out. There was a great story in, I think, Streetsburg this week about the I-81 teardown in Syracuse, which had seemed like one of the most kind of promising ones. And now you have um, a community group there that is trying to tap the brakes on that a little bit and it just sort of is a, an interesting look at how it's not straightforward so so i think that's going to be something to watch and um, there will be money kind of coming through that reconnecting communities program that we've mentioned um uh and yeah one story i'm actually working on right now is just a closer look at the denver e-bikes program and what is that going to mean um you know, I think, I, I think what Martha you were saying about this was being this quiet revolution. Like it's really hard to quite put your finger on it, but it does feel like that there's something going on there, and um, and so teasing that out and seeing and seeing where that goes and 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 what the possibility is for something that is sort of on the one hand it's this hundred plus year old technology the bicycle but on the other hand there's something about you put a little electric motor on it and it seems to just work for people differently and better and so that's going to be something to, to really watch great who wants to go next Alyssa, we'll go with you what are your top stories yeah. for the year um yeah, I would say there is kind of like a, a two, two, I'll, I'll pick two things just like Ian did. Um, one is just looking at, you know, not just the way that people are maybe opting for their e-bikes, but also this more informed um, customer uh, knowledge, I guess, about SUVs and the danger of SUVs. And again, this is a testament to the amazing reporting that we've seen from um, all types of publications, local and national, um, but really saying like, we can't, have, and, and people just photographing themselves, I think with these <laughs> gigantic yeah, trails that go, the time. I mean, this is all I do. Yeah, I walk through every time I, tra every travel, like all summer, <laughs> I was just like taking these pictures of, you know, walking through these like corridors of, of escalades or whatever. But um, it, it really, I think there is maybe a, a watershed moment to be had where people are, are going to start fighting back against 
SUVs either by, you know, popping their tires when in cities. We're not advocating that people pop their tires. We're not advocating for that, okay, but it let's is be very happening. Secure. It is happening. Um, or, you know, but, but it, or, or in a policy way, I guess, like the policy version of that, which is really trying to go after these and say that they are a safety risk and the government is not doing anything about it. And at the same time, maybe this is tied to that, but we are seeing, you mentioned the robo taxis. I did get to ride in one this year. It was actually fine. Um, but I, but you, I think the skepticism of them coming to cities is really strong. And a lot of people are saying, you know, how did this end up here? What, how are we not allowed to make these decisions? Well, they're made at the state level. Well, how did that happen? So finally, people are starting to wake up that like a lot of these, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of these uh, technological solutions that are coming to our streets, we might need to make sure that they are going to be a little bit safer when they're deployed. And not just the whole like Uber implosion, but also the awareness about things like the boring company, which before evil Twitter Elon emerged, you know, there was starting to be a lot of really strong pushback to them coming to cities and saying, we're going to solve your problem um, with tunnels for your cars. Um, and I did get to go ride in that too this year um, in Vegas. Just go to Vegas if you want to ride around in a bunch of uh, things. Maybe we can have our next show there next year to, to kind I'm of for ride that. around all the. <laughs> Meet, meet in a robo taxi and ride through some tunnels. Um, but again, like this is something that a lot of journalists have been banging the drum about for years, that it's not going to be the solution we're looking for. So can we, uh, you know, maybe have more simpler solutions, things like e-bikes instead. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Martha. What, what are your stories for the year? Uh, I am going to be really quick because I know Beth has to leave us momentarily. Uh, I'm just looking at equity in both process and outcomes across everything we've talked about, you know, freeway fighting, transit, charging station placement, e-bikes, uh, electric vehicles. Are we gonna get better at really thinking about who benefits from what and how we bring those voices to the table? Great, Beth? Um, kind of some of this overlaps with Ian and Melissa. Uh, I really do think uh, safety is going to continue to be an issue. However, I think that overall fatalities are going to be reasonably flat or a slight decline, and it will give everybody an excuse to forget that that's a flat or slight decline from record heights, and they'll back off. Uh, uh, apparently, it has to break records for anyone to care. Um so that makes me a little nervous. I think pedestrian deaths will be up by a lot, but overall fatalities will be relatively flat. Right. Um, I do think vehicle size is getting people's attention. And one thing we need to do in the new year is convince USDOT to update their research on uh, the relationship between speed and fatalities, because the current data are based on uh, a study from, I believe, the 1990s or 80s using the vehicle fleet in Great Britain. So it's a little different than the vehicle fleet now. And my guess is if they updated it, we would find that even at 20 miles per hour with these gigantic trucks that would hit me square in the face, um, that the fatalities would be at least double what our current projections are. On the other hand, I'm really excited. I think we're gonna see a, a continued uh, uh, change in, in community uh, use of transportation space based on all the experimentation they did during COVID. And I think other communities, as they see uh, their colleagues do things that are uh, more permanent in terms of eateries and, and space for bike pad and stuff like that, um, uh, we'll, we'll continue to try it. And the last thing I'll say is I really have my eye on the reconnecting community spending. You know, are we going to get real projects? Are we going to see what happened in Syracuse where, yes, they're taking down the viaduct, but they're building a six to eight lane freeway on the ground that will result in a significant increase in fatalities? Because now basically people have the ability to walk across an expressway as a reconnecting communities project. And, you know, can we convince the DOT to question their models and projections that tell them that if you don't have eight lanes, that it will be traffic Armageddon. In spite, they continue to think that, in spite of the fact that every time the models say that they're wrong, they that they still believe the models can't be uh, possibly countered. So 
that's a space I'm going to spend a lot of time. And I'll close it up. Oh, go ahead. What? I was just saying the models will be right next time. Don't, don't oh, worry. They, they, sure. sure. Yeah. I'll close it out by saying I think the term that you're going to hear a lot about in the coming year is transportation insecurity. Uh, much like we have food deserts, we have transportation deserts, whether it be the lack of access to vehicles, transit, biking, walking, EVs. And I see a new movement of people from communities of color, um, communities that are economically dislocated, that are recognizing that transportation, the lack of affordable and safe transportation is going to be the fulcrum for their ability to get out of poverty and to be able to get the health care and the services and the jobs they need and want. So we'll see if that turns out and if these other predictions turn out next year. Uh, I want to thank our guests. I want to thank Ian Duncan from the Washington Post. Thanks, Ian. I want to okay. thank Alyssa Walker from Curbed in New York Magazine. Thanks, Alyssa. I want to talk. I want to thank uh, Beth Osborne from Transportation for America. Thanks, Beth. And I want to thank my colleague, Martha Rosowski from the Mobility and Access Collaborative. I'm Daryl Young from the Merck Family Fund. Thanks for joining us. If you like this, like it. And we hope to see you soon. Have yourself a good holidays and a good new year. Bye-bye.